Jennifer, hello everyone and welcome as we return to our webinar series after the summer break and today it's on the topic of the role of mass spectrometry imaging in proteomics. We're joined by two speakers, Dr Simon Davis and Professor Malcolm Clench, alongside our guest chair for today, Professor Reiner Kramer. Reiner will chair the question and answer session after both talks in a roundtable discussion with both our speakers. So I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before we hand over to our guest chair to introduce the first speaker. As always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussion, um, so please join us there to ask the questions and please use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you'd like to hear answered. We also have the Q&A uh, in the Teams uh, chat if you want to put your questions there instead. Please try and direct your questions to each speaker by naming them as we'll be having the joint Q&A and roundtable after both talks have happened. So for those of you who need an attendance certificate for this webinar, the details will be available on how to get this after the last slide. And uh, just to go through our thank you. So we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. And thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metal Metabolomics Network and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. We're also grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support. Thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers. Both the talks today will be available to watch again afterwards online. And so thank you to our speakers and our guest chair for their time today. And now I will introduce you to Reiner. So Professor Reiner Kramer is a Alexander von Humboldt Fellow and Professor of Mass Spectrometry and Bioanalytical Sciences and the Head of Biomedical Molecular and Analytical Chemistry at the University of Reading. He's an interdisciplinary researcher who started his academic career as an experimental physicist and later moved on to cancer research and other research fields in the life sciences. He has a strong background in proteomic, biological mass spectrometry and analytical chemistry. His research interests are focused on the application of his physical science expertise to the analytical challenges posed by modern biosciences. He has a strong interest in the fundamentals of mass spectrometry, particularly MOLDI MS, so we're very much looking forward to his contributions to the roundtable discussion with our speakers after the talks. So it's over to you, Reiner, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much, Joe, uh, for this very kind introduction. Um, and welcome to everybody here uh, to this webinar. Uh, we have two great speakers here and uh, I would like without any further ado to start straight away with the introduction of the first speaker here, which is uh, who is Dr. Simon Davis. So our first speaker today uh, is a postdoc in the group of Professor Roma Fischer at the Target Discovery Institute at the University of Oxford. His research focuses on the spatial organization of the proteome within healthy and diseased tissues using laser capture microdissection and mass spectrometry based proteomics to profile proteome changes across tissue structures. He'll be talking to us today about the spatially resolved tissue proteomics of a human brain tumor. So without any further ado, over to you, Simon. Thanks, Rainer. Um, I think I should be able to control now. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so today I'm going to share some of the work I've been doing um, in collaboration with a few of the members over the past few years into developing a workflow for spatially resolved proteomics of tissue. And here I'm just going to be showing it in the context of a, of a human brain tumour. So first, maybe why do we... Oh, uh, the slide doesn't seem to be changing for me. Do you want to try the arrow keys, Simon? Sometimes that works better. Ah, OK. Um, yeah, I've clicked. Ah, OK, great. Sorry about that. Um, so firstly, why are we interested in proteomics with spatial resolution in tissues? Um, I'm sure you're all aware that tissues are often heterogeneous structures made up of a variety of different cell types and substructures. Um, and there are a variety of uh, interactions within between these features within the tissue. And the spatial context of, of all of this is key for understanding pathology, but also function in, in healthy tissue. Um, and I'm sure an audience like this is aware of the power of typical mass spec based proteomics experiments to provide information on biological function. But the way we do that typically by um, lysing and homogenizing our tissues and cells uh, do not preserve spatial information. Um, and there's 
kind of in the field, there's two ways of thinking about the term spatial. Uh, one is where people look at um, subcellular resolution, different organelles. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about is distribution within tissue. Um, so the way we do this is by a technique called laser capture microdissection. Um, and this is uh, uh, just a fairly standard optical microscope with a laser that can be fired along the optical path, which allows us to isolate cells or larger features of interest from the tissue um, by the laser cutting around the feature to separate it from the substrate. And then that can be collected in a contact-free manner by another laser pulse into a waiting receptacle either above or below the tissue, depending on the system. And we're obviously not the first people to do this. Um, we published uh, an optimized method on, on our brain tissue in 2019, but there are plenty of other studies that have looked at using LCM coupled to, to mass spectrosomics in, in lung tissue, um, in other tissues, and then there's some other workflow developments based on FFP tissue and also the, the Kelly groups, um, small uh, nanoliter sized um, processing for, for the nanopots. Um, so we are working in this tissue model. Um, this is a ATRT, uh, so atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. Um, it's a highly aggressive pediatric brain tumor. Um, and this is a fresh, fresh frozen specimen that was collected um, post-mortem. And it's about quite a large piece of an even larger tumor. So it's about two centimeters by two centimeters across. So our approach for, for profiling the, the proteome across this tissue is to use the laser capture micros microscope to cut this tissue into a regular grid. Um, and then we can think of each of these uh, grid elements as a pixel, like in an image. Um, so for every pixel, we isolate it, lyse the proteins within, digest them by uh, SP3, and then we can analyze them on uh, LCM SMS system. And then after quantifying the proteins, uh, we can map each protein quantitation for every pixel back to the spatial locate, location where it came from. And then we get what is essentially a protein image or a protein map um, across the tissue. And then we get one of these uh, maps um, per protein quantified across the whole experiment. Um, so if we take a look at um, some more details of that. So we sampled this area that was uh, two by one and a half centimeters, um, cutting this into um, 384 samples. Uh, so four 96 well plates gives us a pixel size of about 800 micrometers. Um, and then all this was analyzed on a Timsoft Pro on 17 minute DDA gradients. Um, and that gives us about throughput of 40 samples per day. So to do this experiment was about 10 days worth of mass spec time. Um, in total, we got over 5,000 proteins identified um, and in most uh, samples, we ID three to 4,000 proteins. Because um, this is DDA, we quantify a little bit less uh, in each sample, um, but the majority have over, uh, over 2,500 proteins quantified. So if we look at what these, these maps look like on the right-hand side, um, here's the tissue area for reference. So I don't know how well this comes through, but in the top right region, there's some uh, hemorrhage and then in the, in the center region here, this is uh, what we've termed the solid tumor core. On the left hand side, you might be able to see it looks uh, a little bit different. Um, and this is an area of tissue with a mixture of tumor and normal cells. And we've just turned this uh, brain, the brain tumor interface. Um, so looking at hemoglobin, where we plot color code, the intensity for every pixel based on the scale on the right. So yellow is high, blue is uh, low. Uh, we see high hemoglobin in the area of hemorrhage, which is what we would expect, and then fairly consistent expression across most of the tissue, but some higher expression perhaps in this bottom left and bottom right hand corners. Um, looking at histone, uh, this uh, histone H4, this is more homogeneously expressed, homogeneously expressed across the region of the whole tissue. Um, and now looking at a, a marker for, for neurons, um, peripherin, this is mainly expressed towards the um, edges of the tissue with, with lower lower abundance in the center on the tumor core. Um, and then the, then the opposite case can be true. So we have these two examples, this uh, glycogen phosphorylase um, and um, this beta hydroxylase. They're most 
the main abundance is found in the centre of the tumour and the solid core, um, with lower abundance um, towards the, the periphery. Um, so upon seeing this, we were quite happy to see that there are there are differences and broadly based on the limited histology information we have, um, this perhaps makes sense that the tumour is, is uh, regulating this enzyme to perhaps help fulfil its energy needs. Um, but instead of needing to look through um, 5,000 protein maps, uh, we wanted a way to filter the data. And so we settled on this approach, uh, which is called Moran's eye. And it's just a test for spatial autocorrelation, um, where you're looking to see if the data is more spatially clustered than, than by random chance. So there's a nice, nice example on the left, left here, where these similar values cluster together in space, and, and so do these ones. Um, and then you have the case where they're randomly distributed, so there's, there's no pattern between them. And then there's also the, the case where um, like a high value is always followed by a low value, but we, we don't really see this in our data. Um, and then this Moran's index returns a value between minus one and one, just uh, representing perfect dispersion through randomness, through to perfect clustering. So if we apply this to our protein, protein maps, um, we can see that hemoglobin has a, a middling uh, index, might mainly going to be driven by the, the hemorrhage here and then also these regions in the bottom left and bottom right. Um, histone H4 has a, has a value quite close to zero, um, as we would expect by looking at the image, it's generally quite homogeneous, uh, no, no real clustering. Um, and then for the other three examples, um, we see reasonably high values, um, again, which fits as what we would expect just by, by eye. Um, so we wanted to, to validate these, uh, these protein expression maps. Um, so we bought some antibodies and some were good, some were bad. Here are some of the, the good antibodies. So we have one for the, the phosphorylase, the hydroxylase, and then also for CD45, which is a, a lymphocyte marker. Um, and then the, the panels on the right correspond to the, the boxes in the maps on the left. Um, and we can see that the, the, H, uh, the immunosic chemistry staining uh, generally agrees with what we see in the proteomics data. Um, so high in the tumour, more or more intense staining in the tumour for, the, for the, the top two. And then in this top left corner, we see start to see um, positive staining for CD45, perhaps indicating that there's some infiltration of, of the uh, immune, immune cells into the tumour. So this uh, immune cell infiltration um, got us a bit interested. So I went to have a look back to the data to look for um, good cell markers uh, that have already been validated at elsewhere um, and see what their expression levels are. And as an example, we can see two um, neutrophil markers here in the very upper left, and then two macrophage markers um, still in the upper left, but actually their, their peak abundance is spatially distinct between the two macrophage um, markers and the two neutrophil markers, um, which is quite encouraging to see. Um, so we can move from that level, which was a sort of single protein level, up towards a pathway level approach. Um, and here we've performed um, gene set enrichment analysis for, for each individual pixel. Um, and then the, uh, this shouldn't say protein intensity, this, sh this should say um, enrichment, essentially. Um, we can see a few pathways which um, are spatially uh, differential between the tissue. So um, there's this chromatin organization, uh, sumoylation. Um, this is perhaps interesting because the, the main loss of function gene in this tissue is um, involved in chromatin organization. Um, we see different uh, angiogenesis uh, abundances. Again, the, this neutrophil marker is coming out strongly in, in this top left corner and then also some, some signaling pathways as well. Um, so this is quite nice, but we can also go uh, maybe one step further to a more global overview uh, where we have performed some clustering of, of the, the data. So this is just standard hierarchical clustering. Um, and then the, the clusters from that, they, uh, we don't use the protein, we don't use the spatial information but they're still coming out with um, spatially uh, clustered uh, clusters, so to speak. 
So in this bottom left hand corner, we see um, some clusters that fall along the, the border that we identified in the histology data between this uh, region of uh, mixture of cells and the solid tumour. Um, and then also we see in this top left region, um, a couple of clusters which uh, co co correspond with that, the border between the neutrophil and the macrophage uh, markers, and then also some heterogeneity within, within the rest of the tissue. Um, and then of course, we can also plot these cluster assignments onto um, a UMAP projection, um, and they also cluster uh, reasonably nicely um, together in this as well. Um, so we're, we're sort of thinking that this can be used to hone in on the different regions of tissue where there's where there's variation um, that's not necessarily seen by by a standard histology stain, such as between these uh, clusters within the tumor, um, for example. So finally, some some data on the heterogeneity of the extracellular matrix proteins uh, within the tissue. Um, we get quite good coverage, um, about 100 or 150 proteins that have been annotated as, as uh, extracellular matrix within matrisome DB. Um, so we see a variety of collagens which are uh, showing spatial differential spatial abundances. Um, so this is collagen 2 and collagen 11. They're higher within, within the, the solid tumour, um, for example. Um, and we're also seeing um, proteins like CD44 and, and other uh, proteins that are more associated with these direct structural uh, proteins. Um, and we also see some variation in the uh, expression of the abundance of, of integrin um, uh, proteins. So one interesting observation here is this um, integrin alpha M. This along with the integrin beta 2 uh, quite high in the area of neutrophils. Um, and this is consistent with uh, this alpha M beta 2 uh, integrin heterodimer being uh, one of the major integrin receptors on neutrophils. Um, and then there's also um, this integrin alpha 10, which along with uh, beta 1, so alpha 10 beta 1 heterodimer, this has been shown to bind to um, collagen 11 and collagen 2. And so the integrin alpha 10 and the two collagens have all their expression, uh, their, their peak expression within the solid tumor. Um, and this is perhaps interesting because there's some evidence in glioblastoma um, xenografts that targeting this alpha 10 uh, beta 1 integrin receptor um, can have some therapeutic potential. But of course, here we're not measuring uh, functional association between these, between these uh, proteins. Um, but for that functional association to happen, they do at least have to be expressed within the same place. Um, so after seeing the range of heterogeneity at the protein level, uh, we were interested in exploring heterogeneity of other biomolecules. So in collaboration with um, Unina at, at Brooker, um, we sent some samples and she performed perform some uh, mold imaging and, uh, analysis focusing on lipids. Um, so if we look at the, the clustering of this mold imaging, we can see the same broad features that we see in the protein data. Um, here in the, the bottom left is, is that region of uh, brain tumor interface. Here in the center is what we term the solid tumor, and we can kind of pick up this nice border. And then there's also a cluster in this top left, uh, which would correspond to the broad area of that immune cell infiltration. So um, this hasn't been yet confirmed by MSMS. We're still working on that, but there are two ions um, on the left and the right, which by the MS1 mass at least, corresponds to um, the sodiated and potassiated forms of cholesterol ester. And they're localized around where we would expect from the proteomic data the, the macrophage cells to be. And this is consistent with uh, macrophages often um, having quite a large amount of cholesterol within their, within their cytosol. Um, and then you can just see again the macrophage markers here corresponds to roughly this, this area on this serial section. So back to the proteomics, um, we were doing this at 800 micron resolution. Um, there's no reason why we can't do higher resolution because the laser capture microscope can cut single cells. Um, but of course, if we start cutting out less material, 
then um, we have less input material for our process and then generally in proteomics that that results in a, a drop in protein IDs. So we sort of characterize this behavior here for the at least for the conditions that we used for the main experiment. Um, so for the main experiment we're somewhere here at the plateau and then we can get down to um, what is this 30,000 uh, square microns which is about 180 micron resolution before it um, really starts to drop off. But with here, we're still seeing 2000 IDs, um, which corresponds to somewhere between 80 and uh, 200 cells. It always depends on how big your cells are, of course. Um, and then, so the main uh, avenue we're exploring to upping this resolution, but trying to maintain our depth is to uh, switch to, to DIA. And I don't have any data on this tissue, but in HeLa, um, which is always the best case scenario, we see either a, between a 50 and 100% gain in the number of proteins quantified, um, which is very promising. There's also the trade-off of time. So I said this, we did that at 40 samples per day, um, and that took about 10 days. Um, we have an EVA step in our lab. So at running the, the 200 samples per day method, we could theoretically perform the same experiment within two days. Um, of course, presumably with a loss of depth, but maybe with DIA we can we can help recover that. Um, and then that is getting close to perhaps what is acceptable for an amount of time to spend on, on a single sample. Um, but we're still still not really there yet for that. I think there could be a few more lines below this, um, perhaps with newer generations of instruments that are coming, or um, better better DIA methods or something. Um, we can really com could improve this. So it would become more feasible to run small scale studies of, of an experiment like this. Um, and then here's just a comparison to moldy imaging. So in, in, in that to image the same time around 10 pixels per second, it would take uh, less than a day and we get many more data points. But of course, the uh, advantage that our approach has over the moldy imaging um, is that we get much greater depth, even if we don't have um, such an excellent resolution. So maybe some thoughts on future directions. Um, one thing I'm quite keen to try is the, these multiplex DIA approaches, which are emerging. So the, the Slavov lab, lab recently published um, a threeplex uh, DIA using non uh, non isotopic non uh, mass tags. Um, so that would, in, perhaps in combination with a uh, faster chromatography, perhaps get us to around the one sam one sample. Uh, per day uh, marker. Um, but where we're really hoping to, to make some gains is to um, use uh, image analysis and uh, sort of machine learning approaches, um, as of such that has been done in some transcriptomic studies where they've uh, performed um, transcriptomics at low resolution, combine that with traditional imaging approaches, and then use the, the images to sort of in, uh, computationally improve their, their resolution. Um, I we can't really see why this wouldn't work for our data, um, but I think we would need a larger data set than what we've acquired so far. Um, and then perhaps the other approach would be partial sampling approaches. So is it, instead of uh, analyzing each of the 384 pixels here, uh, maybe we could analyze uh, every other one or one, one every four, and then also combine that with um, alternate approaches, so moldy imaging or perhaps other multiplexed uh, protein measurements, along with uh, some machine learning. But obviously this, you know, we haven't done this yet, so who knows if this is possible to, to, to recreate our, our data stack. So just to summarize then, um, I've shown that we, we have a, a nice workflow for the unbiased systematic sampling of tissue uh, using laser capture microdissection, and that can give us uh, protein measurements on thousands of proteins with spatial resolution. Um, and we think this is a nice alternative to, to what most of the field have been doing, because um, if you're cutting out features that, are, uh, that you stain for or that you see in H&E, um, that's obviously still very useful, but you might be missing things or variation within those features that you're then combining together. Um, so this approach can provide some information on that. Um, and then also with some not to sophisticated data analysis. Um, we've shown that the, these proteomic phenotypes can be detected um, that are spatially resolved within the tissue. Um, but then, of course, that 
the, the expectations of our spatial resolution has to be balanced with what is an acceptable proteomic depth for our experiment and also the analysis time. Finally, I'd just uh, like to thank a few people. So um, Roman Fisher and Benedict Kessler for their, for their supervision during my PhD and now my postdoc. And then also um, Phil for data analysis help, Yolanda and Raphael for many hours of mass specs. Um, Olaf is, is uh, was also one of my supervisors. He's the neuropathologist on this project. And also to Connor for lots of uh, really key help with the histology and staining. Um, Yanina at Brooker for the for the mouldy imaging and continued support, and then also um, Jenny Ho from from Thermo for some help with the um, LC gradient. Um, and then earlier this year we we published a preprint of this uh, work, um, so you can if you're interested you can check this out or, or get in touch with us. And then also um, a thank you to our funders and then the whole of the the Kessler group in the TDI. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simon, for this great first talk. Uh, nicely demonstrating how you can get a handle on uh, proteomics coverage uh, in imaging as well, which is great. Uh, as it's usual, um, we're going to have uh, also the questions for Simon at the end of uh, the webinar, so at the end of the second talk. And uh, that brings me therefore straight to our second speaker, who is Professor Malcolm Clench. Professor Clench is head of the Biomolecular Science Research Center at Sheffield Hallam University, and he leads the Imaging and Moldy Special Interest Group of the BMSS and was awarded the Society's Lectureship from 2006 to 2008. He is a member of the Executive Advisory Board of the Journal Proteomics and was UK Management Re uh, Representative for the EU Cost Action for Mass Spectrometry Imaging New Tools for Healthcare Research between 2012 and 2015. So today he will be speaking to us about applications of mass spectrometry imaging to 3D cell culture. Over to you, Malcolm. Thank you very much, Rona. I'll just wait for my slides to appear. Thank you very much. OK, so firstly, thanks very much to the organisers for inviting me to speak to you today. So uh, being aware that uh, Simon was going to give that excellent talk with huge protein coverage on what you can do with spatially resolved proteomics, I will merely start my talk by agreeing with him that the coverage of proteomics that you can get from the laser micro dissection and then LCMSMS approach is you know, a factor of 10 greater than you can get from direct Moldy imaging if you're doing untargeted approaches. So we're talking about the role of mass spectrometry imaging. So I thought using 3D cell culture, which is one of our particular areas of strength here at Hallam, I'd show you some of the work that we've done using mass spec imaging to detect drugs, to detect drug metabolites, to detect endogenous metabolites, responses to drugs in the metabolome and in the proteome using a targeted approach rather than an untargeted approach. And perhaps we can see the complementarity between, between the two situations. So I'll give you an overview of the various MSI techniques. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with them. Uh, I'll show you the data and now I, actually, and I also want to sort of um, put some thoughts in your head about personalised medicine and uh, why I think that uh, 3D cellular models are a bit more realistic compared to the xenograft approaches that, that people are trying to push. So mass spectrometry imaging describes a whole variety of techniques that use mass spectrometers to generate images and clearly we can use all the different mass spec platforms, we can use the QTOFs, we can use Orbitraps, FTICR or TOFTOFs, but really what distinguishes between the various imaging modalities is the way that you generate the ions. And what's common about all of them though is that you fire something at the surface, you extract dissolved ions from the surface, sorry, extract, extract and di or dissolve ions from the surface, species from the surface which are either dissolved as ions or are then ionized afterwards. So we can do that with a laser, we can do it with a stream of dot blitz, we can do it with a highly focused ion beam, we can do it with a high energy laser so that we actually completely destroy the sample. Uh, 
and then that goes into inductively coupled plasma torch. So here it would just purely laser ablation. And then a variant on that is to use this same instrument, but to metal tag an antibody so that we can do a targeted protein approach and actually get images of protein distributions of low abundance within the tissue that we probably wouldn't see with any of these approach and still probably you know, may well even not see with the spatially resolved proteomics approach because we go to targeted. So similarly to Simon's talk, each pixel in those images, we fire, the, fire our whatever it is we're using to create the ions. Each place that we've irradiated becomes a pixel in the image where we just extract mass and intensity values to reconstruct an image. Between the different modalities, we have different spatial resolution uh, ranging from the sims giving you the best spatial resolution submicron uh, through to probably out of all the ones I show there the desorption electrospray being the poorest with around sort of 20 micron from conventional a bit better for nano desi uh, but say let's say 20 micron optimum for desi for, for desi okay I am definitely pressing arrow keys now Okay, thanks. Whatever you did there, it worked, Jack. Right, so uh, Centre for Mass Spec Imaging here at Hallam. Uh, we have spent a lot of money to create a Centre for Mass Spec Imaging. This is all the kit we've got. Uh, we've pretty much now decided to focus down on Walters kit. So we now have two Walters MRTs, one for Maldi and Desi, a Walters cyclic instrument, uh, a synapt excess and a laser ablation set up, a couple of TOF TOFs and a couple of older instruments as, as well. And you can see I've put on the slides the sort of difference between the mass analyzer platforms and between the sort of performance of spatial resolution that you can get out of the instruments. So with the modern instruments, we're looking at 100,000 plus mass resolution. You can see for this even the cyclic TOF, which has the big IMS cell on it, still gives you 100,000 mass resolution. But the, the MRT, uh, which we've bought a couple of, one for Maudie and one for Desi, with 200,000 plus mass resolution. So very much a TOF-based competitor for, for Orbi traps. Okay, so you're gonna say, stop waggling my mouse, aren't you? That's what's doing it. So if you could make me, allow me to advance the slide again, Jack, that would be great. Yeah, so you might need to click again or request control again. Yeah, got it. OK, thank you. So we've got a whole load of different areas of focus within the center. Uh, you may well be familiar with the work of my colleague, Professor Simona Francesi, where she's actually extracting proteomic information from finger marks. So she does both endogenous proteins because finger marks are sweat mostly so you can actually extract information from the finger mark and from the proteins that you see in the finger mark you can get biometric information you can get lifestyle information so you can see uh, what things people are handling and uh, with about 85 percent accuracy at the moment Simona is able to predict the sex of someone who has deposited a finger mark whether they're male or female and clearly in terms of some way of either eliminating people from a list of suspects that, that's quite powerful uh, we do disease pathology disease treatment we create images of both animal tissue and 3d cell construct which i'm going to focus on in a moment and we do a lot of work on plants and agrochemicals distribution of of herbicides etc so let's get into the body of the talk So drug distribution studies are bread and butter for mass spec imaging. Uh, although the earliest paper from Caprioli, which was on Maudi imaging, was on protein distribution, very quickly people picked up, well, that's quite interesting, but we're a pharmaceutical industry. It'd be really nice to see where our drug had gone. So pretty quickly afterwards, people were starting to plot the distribution of drugs using Maudi imaging. We've done a lot of work on skin absorption. So I'll just look here at this tibidifin chloride absorbing into a 3D skin model. So those of you who are not familiar with 3D models, one of the easiest 3D models to construct is skin, have a scaffold, layer down some vibroblasts, let them grow, 
stick some Karatna sites on top of that, let them develop, they self-assemble into the layers and you've got something that looks like skin. So that's what a 3D skin model looks like. It looks like a sort of pink lozenge and a transworld plate. So you can use that for all sorts of experiments uh, and all we've been doing is using it for drug absorption. Uh, that was some of the work that we did a bit ago actually, probably 2018, 2019 this work. So we put the drug on the top, vertically section it, and then we can image the distribution of the drug and see where it's gone. The tabinafin here is shown in pink. Uh, it's actually designed to be a topical treatment as it's not supposed to go into systemic circulation. So you can see that this particular formulation is working as a topical treatment. So simple experiment, but you know, if you think about a mass spec image experiment here, non-labeled straight out of the actual commercial formulation using the, the skin model, we can get the answer. And then the work that we do in this area, working with various pharmaceutical companies or chemical manufacturers is to look at the effect of different formulations on the drug absorption. So we'll add different excipients, uh, different formulations and see what happens. Of course, we can also de endogenous. So here we're actually looking, we were doing, looking at, uh, I can't give too much details on this project, but these are quite nice images of skin. And again, you can see the uppermost epidermal layers of the skin in these DESI experiments. And we were looking at this sort of interaction between a particular drug and the skin microbiome where these, these skins actually had bacterial infections on the surface. So what's going to the, our new toys doing for us? So as I, before you visitors came online, I just said we had a second MRT delivered this morning because we want this high mass resolution. We want the high mass resolution, which gives us specificity and this instrument gives us really good sensitivity as well. So a simple example of what we've been able to do first off, and this is a DESI experiment and this is a 50 micron, so not particularly great image quality, but what it really is showing that when we get to a high performance mass spectrometer with a DESI system on it, we can start to get certainty of assignment and the extra sensitivity is enabling us to do things that we haven't been able to do before. So looking at living skin equivalent models, the ones that you buy off the shelf, they are useful, but they've got a couple of limitations. One is that in terms of doing the absorption experiments, compared to real skin, they're quite porous. Yep. So you do need some fiddle factors if you're going to actually predict what the absorption rates you get from the model are compared to real skin. And secondly, they are, although they contain drug metabolizing enzymes, the distribution of drug metabolizing enzymes within the living skin equivalent models isn't the same as human skin. So here in this experiment, what we've done is we've actually induced activity by chemical treatment of the living skin equivalent model. And we can come back to um, Simon's point about coverage. However, the levels of enzymes within the skin is still too low to actually see directly on an Maudi imaging experiment. Uh, you know, maybe one day we'll try some spatially resolved proteomics like Simon's doing to see if you could still, you could see the enzymes then. But of course you don't actually need to see the enzymes. We can do what we called substrate based mass spec imaging. So what we can do is we can put a probe in. So here we use benzidamine and we know that benzidamine is metabolized by a certain P450, cytochrome P450 isoform and by a, a certain flavin model oxygenase. So what we can do is we can look at the skin and we can see, are we seeing the products of that process? So we can see the metabolites being formed because we have actually increased the activity of those two enzymes by the chemical induction. So yeah, this is recent data. And uh, although the images will to you will think, well, they're not particularly exciting mass spec images. To me, they're really exciting because we've only been at this for about five years and we've never been able to see those metabolites before in an image. We can see them in LCMSMS, but not, not in the images. So, so that's very nice. Yep. Okay, these, is mass spec imaging quantitative? I've been through this a few times, but I still get people knocking back to me saying, no, mass spec imaging isn't quantitative. Uh, it is, you can make it quantitative. All you actually have to do is do your standardization properly. So matrix match standards, we need our standards like any surface analysis technique to actually match the matrix that we're analyzing from. So we do that by microspotting. So we microspot 
standards that we're trying to analyze onto the tissue and we do it in this case with an acoustic spotter and we can put picoliter droplets of authentic standards onto the tissue then integrate the signals from the little pink dots which are the standards integrate those signals to create calibration curves again basic analytical chemistry if you incorporate an internal standard an isotopically internal standard into the experiment you get better calibration data you bet better quantification and then we can actually do the measurements we want which is to show in this case that the penetration enhancer does work it increases the amount of turbinafin that's absorbed into the epidermal layer of the skin okay so simple experiments so let's change tack for the second half of my talk and I'll, in the middle of it i'll give an opinion so so I think you all know what personalized medicine is and what people are aiming towards, and that is to design a specific treatment based on the particular genetic polymorphisms that an individual has, which indicates how they might well respond to that treatment. So even uh, in 2020, you can go and, and pull out papers that described patient derived xenografts as the future of personalized medicine. I don't think this is realistic. I don't think it is. Why don't I think it is? It's just numbers. So let's think about if we're trying to actually target a treatment at a patient. So we've got our biopsy sample from the patient. Then to create a xenograph, we've got to actually grow it up in a mouse. If we're going to try multiple treatments, we're going to need multiple mice. We're going to need multiple xenographs. So people can disagree, but let's say it's you know one mouse per treatment, perhaps. So if we start to put some numbers on this, 350,000 cases of cancer in the UK per year, two alternative treatments, single dose level, six mice, 2,100,000 mice. So if you're going to design personalized medicine for each, because we're talking personalized medicine, we're not talking a batch process here. Yeah, that would look for 100 people who've got vaguely similar tumors, which we're trying to say we're going to do personalized medicine. So if we're looking at 2,100,000 mice, we don't even have to think about whether we think that's ethical. The cost of that is going to be ridiculous. It's not feasible. And if we go to a country like China, where there's four and a half million cases of cancer a year, is it's not feasible at all. However, patient derived organoids, where we actually take that same biopsy and use those cells to create mimics of tumors in the laboratory in in vivo, sorry, in vitro experiments, gives us the potential for unlimited material. And then we maybe have a route into personalized medicine. So that's my proposition, and that's why we're playing around with patient with organoids and with 3D tissue models. And I also think that mass spec imaging combined with patient derived organoids has a role for large scale personalized medicine. Maybe not with the technology we're playing around with at the moment, but with future technologies. So we've created an aggregated tumor model, these tumor spheroids. So we're all familiar with tumor spheroids, I'm sure, which are small tumors that can be grown in the lab, but we can aggregate them together to create something of about a millimeter in diameter. They look like solid tumors. They've got the oxygen gradient, but they're bigger than a normal spheroid. They're around a millimeter in size. They're a nice size for mass spec imaging. We put them in our mass, we section them just in the same way we would a full tissue section. We put them in our mass spectrometer and we apply, run the, the mass spec imaging experiment. These are DESI MS experiments untargeted. And then we run segmentation software and you can see that we're seeing the regions of a solid geometry, that tumor that you would expect, a proliferating zone on the outside. We can see a region of hypoxia and then we can see a pretty necrotic region in the middle. These particular mass spec imaging data is metabolomics 
data, which is set the mass spectrometer, high resolution mass spec to look at the low mass region. And we're pulling out signals that we can readily identify because we're doing accurate mass and assign them to, to known metabolites associated with cancer. Pyruvate, lactate, glutamine, glutamate. And you can see there that I'm actually talking about elements of the TCA cycle. So why don't we actually map those images onto the TCA cycle? And then we can look at the changes within the tumour. We can see the Wahlberg effect. We can see the sort of things that you'd expect to be going on within the tumour. And it's nice to see them in an image. Yeah, we know all these images convey a lot of information very, very quickly, much better than tables, much better than graphs. The images are really powerful. They're very easy to understand. We can also do this targeted proteomics approach using the, the imaging mass cytometry approach. And here you can see with these one micron images where we can actually look down at specific proteins and see their distribution in the organoid, in the spheroid, sorry, in the aggregated spheroid. And again, we can see markers of cell proliferation, markers of hypoxia, markers of DNA damage within the tumor by looking at these specific proteins. So again, this is mass spec imaging data from imaging mass cytometry. Uh, I always show this in any talk I get because it's probably some of the most beautiful mass spec imaging data we've, we've ever obtained in the years we've, we've been doing it. But we want to do something like that so we can do now start to do response to treatment. What's been the whole point of this? We can do the same experiments showing changes in those images in a regional manner as response to treatment with small molecules, with doxorubicin. But in terms of the proteomic aspect of this talk, we'd like to do it for biologics. So we can do it for MABs, we can do it by a conventional bottom-up proteomics approach. We can do on tissue digests and we can look for signature peptides for, for example, cetuximab in the in the 3D tumor. And we can do that in a reasonably responsive manner, in a quantitative manner. We can show that it's real. And we can actually start to look at the response again here. We're looking at metabolites again. We can look at the response in the aggregated model to the cetuximab treatment and show changes going on. So that's pretty much my time up. So I think we're, we're in 2022 and I've given a talk where I've introduced the principles of mass spec imaging, uh, which many of you now know. So it is an established technology. All big pharma companies have mass spec imaging groups and they're using a range of different imaging modalities to do the sort of work that I'm describing to you now. Our multiplex label free use of mass spec imaging gives us the potential to do these what essentially are pharmacodynamic experiments we're looking at effects of drugs on tissue and we can do that in a spatially resolved way if you're going to get into mass spec imaging in a big way and you're committed to it uh, my advice is don't hang your hat on one of the imaging modalities all of them have got limitations and all of them have restrictions in the type of molecules you can look at. You really want to, at the very least, be doing multimodal mass spec imaging, and you probably much more want to be looking at some sort of multimodal imaging facility with some of the other toys that are around for doing high resolution imaging of metabolites and proteins and lipids and all those other things as well. I think there's a lot of mileage in this combination of mass spec imaging with 3D tissue models and organoids. We've been at it for quite a few years now, and hopefully even from these you know, examples that I've shown you on the skin and the 3D model of cancer, you can see the power of combining the techniques together. So what we now need to do, and this is very much the work that's been going on in the Rosetta project that Imperial have been involved in with um, NPL and Glasgow and various other groups, is actually put together that relationship between what we're seeing in in vivo tissue and what we're seeing in the models because i've said to you that our, i know from the years that we've been working on skin models that they have limitations in terms of mimicking 
the in vivo situation, lack of metabolizing enzymes, differences in the way that they absorb drug. We need to understand that for the PDX and the PDO as well, before, so that we can actually translate the findings from what we're doing in the lab. So I'll finish again just with all the acknowledgements. That's the group here at Sheffield and all the various sponsors that have supported us over the years. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Malcolm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, great talks. And uh, yeah, just to remind everyone who's listening, if they can put their questions into the Slack channel so that Reiner can uh, answer any questions that you guys would like answered. And otherwise, I'll just uh, hand over to Reiner to start the discussion with the questions that we have so far. Thanks, Reiner. That's great. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, uh, before we come to those questions, maybe maybe I should start with a question here coming from the proteomic side of things as well. Um, this was uh, really great to see also the multimodal approach and, and going away from the classic moldy imaging in a way. And, and I think a lot of people might be interested in, in knowing uh, about your experiences uh, where you would actually say uh, the depth of the classic moldy imaging actually is for the detection of proteins. Is it just the heme you can see uh, or, or beyond this now seeing the protein itself as well, seeing actually uh, also peptides, larger peptides, proteins? Is it just the 10 most abundant proteins you might see? W what's what's your experience? Where does actually Moldy stop really uh, detecting those uh, larger biomolecules compared to what we all know, metabolized lipids and so on. We all can actually do that, I guess. But but where does yeah, it actually yeah. stop with the peptides and proteins, the larger ones? Maybe on board. Okay. Okay. Maybe, just, if you want to do you want me to start first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I used to show a few slides about this question. So I think it's there's detection and identification. So so if you look at a, a non tissue digest that's been acquired in a moldy mode. There are perhaps 100, 200 identifiable signals in it. Uh, uh, sorry, identifiable proteins you'll get out of it. Yep. But what there's also in the data always there, and it's exactly what you'd expect to be there, is this huge hump of data, which I have always believed is what you'd expect is another thousand peptide peaks, but they're just not resolved mass spectrometrically from each other. Yeah, and they're not abundant enough. They're not resolved well enough in the in the mass dimension for you to be able to assign anything to them. Is, is so that I, the question of uh, mass spec resolution? So if you would, uh, I assume this might have been uh, more like an axial top, whatever instrument. Yeah, if you yeah. go to an FTRCR, would that be better? Or, um... That's better, yeah. I mean, it's better, but I, I'm giving best case scenario, we're in the hundreds. Yep, mm -hmm. that's, you're throwing your best mass spectrometer that we have at it. So you can solve that problem, but then you've got the ionization problem. Oh, sorry, and then we can put a, and an I mobility cell on it and we can add some dimension of separation to do, but actually create better than just having mass resolution. So we've got mobility as well, and that will give us a bit more. So we, we can throw mass spectrometry at it, but we've still got the problem that in the ion source, we actually get you know, com competition for charge. So we, we are only ionizing a finite number of proteins in the ion, ionization event from hitting one single area of tissue. Okay, yeah. maybe so I can Simon, ask yeah. exactly yeah, yeah. the same because you're coming. Uh, sorry, Malcolm, you, you've got the perfect setup for imaging there, so you've got loads of instruments and so on. But uh, maybe for a lab where there are not ten uh, imaging instruments there, uh, Simon, what, what's your kind of view on this? Yeah, I mean, so we're we're still very new to the to the the like classical mass spec imaging field. We we got a Tim Stoff Flex um, about a month ago. Um, so I don't have too much data to comment on, but um, in the demo we did with Yanina, um, she also did some peptide imaging and we see some nice differential ions between our tumor regions. But when I, uh, we didn't have time to do MSMS on them, but when I looked at the LCMS data I had, there were, for some of the ions, there were eight, 10, 15 peptides, which uh, would fit within the mass uh, error tolerance of that one iron that we see. So I think um, 
obviously with like Malcolm said, I'm ability maybe can help us, but um, and what I'm kind of along the lines that I think it might be too complex for quite a while to to get anything uh, to be confident of of lots of IDs. I think I think we're we're leaning towards sticking towards the lipid side of things. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. okay. So I think that might actually kind of uh, bring peace to a lot of people's questions in terms of why don't I see those peptides or proteins? Uh, so it's, it's not uncommon uh, not to see these ultimately. Uh, may, maybe I can stick with you, Simon, a little bit. Uh, we, we had questions uh, for you about automation. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, liquid handling, I guess, in there as well, well involved. Uh, how far do you actually consider automation and how far can it actually help to, to get a better or, or increase in speed or throughput ultimately? Yeah, so for the data I showed, um, that was all me, uh, at least with a multi-channel, so it wasn't too bad. Um, could probably do two plates per day um, and not be very stressed. Um, but we have a, an Agilent Bravo robot um, in our lab, um, so we can apply the SP3 method um, uh, on their protocols. And there's a paper from the Kreitzfeld lab to show this, they call it Auto SP3, um, and that works quite nicely. Um, I'm not uh, at the point yet where I would trust the robot with an experiment that large, um, but for the tests we've done, um, it's uh, as good or better than the data than the data I, I uh, process. Yeah. So that's something we're looking into, definitely. Oh, OK. And and there was a follow up question possibly on this also with, with a view to increase speed. Um, why did you decide to start with DDA? I think you mentioned later DIA, so DDA uh, data dependent acquisition compared to data independent acquisition. Uh, any views on that? Uh, yeah, so all the data was DDA um, simply because this was acquired a while ago. Um, we hadn't established DIA in our lab when these experiments started and for consistency reasons. We wanted to stick with we know we had something from work that worked for the tests um but yeah so for the for the future we're going to be using dia definitely because in our other tests we've like everyone we see the increase in quantification depth um, and it also allows us to possibly shave some time off the gradient too if we want to keep our depth the same so yeah definitely looking towards that in the future before I come back to Malcolm, maybe I ask you a question about the different slices you actually cut. Uh, you have one uh, that also went for moldy imaging. Um, would you be able to use the moldy image slice to then actually analyze that with your uh, laser micro dissection and, and do a triptych digest afterwards so you have exactly the same slice or uh, maybe you've done it anyway uh, but I assume you, you've done subsequent slices or, or what slices did you use for the various different modalities? Uh, yeah so um, that was uh, um, serial section so not the same slice for proteomics and, and imaging um, but there are um, a couple of papers out there I think from the uh, Ron Herons group in the Netherlands where they've done exactly this moldy imaging on, on a slide, sent it for laser capture, and then they've translated their interesting moldy imaging features to be able to cut that out automatically on the microscope, and then they do trips in and then, uh, and then LCMS. And that, and that looks quite nice. And yeah, that, that is also something we're uh, maybe looking towards for, for most projects would be to do the mass spec imaging, find the interesting features from that, and then do the proteomics. Good, thank you. Well, uh, talking about slices, maybe Malcolm, uh, if, if you think about your organoids there, uh, you showed some really nice 3D images. Uh, how many slices do you actually go to, to get or use to get to those images there? Yeah, about 50 for those. Yeah, it was quite it a lot of work. Yeah. So they're very thin then, I guess. OK. Yeah. Um, there was a question about iron suppression to some extent, and, and I think in general terms, uh, and maybe also for both, but particularly for Malcolm here. Um, do you see that happening, particularly with uh, the over, I guess, ubiquitous or abundant lipids? Uh, do you see lipids are around that uh, these will actually have a huge effect on your, uh, particularly the, the heterogeneous distribution on the signals of, of the drugs or substrates you're look, looking at? Uh, not so much for the drugs. Uh, for the protein work, then we have to do go through quite an extensive washing procedure. 
and then remove as many lipids as we can, yeah. Oh, okay. And talking a bit more about the drugs, there was a question, would the technology have utility for testing whether a drug crosses the blood-brain barrier? Yeah. Yeah, that's been done. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if you look from the papers from Richard Goodwin's group at Astra, uh, was a student, a part-time student, I supervised John Swales. Yeah, that's it's an analytical chemistry 2015, 16, about that sort of time. You, you mm -hmm. can see that, yeah. And I can see that our audience here also very much towards the proteomics, obviously. Um, let me just ask the question one here again for both, but mainly for Malcolm, possibly. What are the latest developments from peptide moly imaging with the application of trypsin on tissue? Are people doing on tissue imaging or more looking at intact proteins? I think we kind of covered that to some extent, but this is a, even more specific now. Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if, if I give the first answer? As, as I said, sure. uh, we'll, I mean, we're going to revisit it. I mean, because we've got this new tech. Yeah. Uh, so we did a you know, you're quite familiar with the group work of my group. So we did a, a hell of a lot, a lot of this work around, say, maybe running from 2008 up to 2015, 16, where we were doing a lot of bottom up proteomics directly on tissue. And then I thought we'd actually got to the stage that we were all getting a bit fed up with banging our head against the wall. You know, that we'd got to the stage that we could see two or three hundred proteins from a slice and we could identify them, but it was always the same ones. Yeah, the, the abundant ones. Uh, so now the question is, now the technology has moved on and we've got you know this very high mass resolution instrument in the lab. We've got the water cyclic with the you know, 100,000 mass resolution and the very high ion mobility resolution. Where can we go with that? So I think we have to revisit it, but that is the state of the art in terms of the direct imaging is proteins and peptides in the hundreds. If you want the thousands, then you're going for the spatial proteomics, would be my opinion. Simon? Yeah, Simon, yeah. would you agree? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, at, the, at least at the moment, perhaps the best way to do it is to do uh, maybe a low resolution approach with the LCM, find what is broadly changing, and then you probably need to do a targeted method, so like imaging mass cytometry or uh, multiplex stimulus to chemistry or this new uh, moldy um, with the peptide tanks. Oh, the ambergen stuff. Yeah, 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 good, yeah. good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, for now, that's probably the fastest way to get an answer, at least. All right, I've got a couple of quick questions, or maybe, maybe not quick, but uh, maybe quick answers we see. Um, for Malcolm here, um, one Back to your quantitation, I think you showed some uh, isotopically labeled smaller molecule. Would this also be possible for isotopically labeled peptides? Yeah, I'm sure it'll work. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, yep. I thought you would say yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Have... No, I'll, 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 I'll say that the Moldy and mass spec imaging isn't quantitative, urban myth. You just have to do it <laughs> properly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, and the other uh, question here was, um, are you performing positive negative ion switching for the low molecular weight metabolites imaging experiments? No. Have you thought about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah about but it? most of the instruments that we've ever, I've ever used for positive negative switching, it's been a good way of crashing them. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I guess we need to go back to the uh, manufacturers on that front. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think we almost through all of our questions here and uh, can't see any new ones coming in, but uh, that was already a very good range and also very much uh, specific towards the proteomics and, and both talks, I have to say, very nice uh, with regard to, to applications of imaging towards proteomics. So uh, I very much enjoyed that and I would like to thank both presenters here and obviously uh, the entire audience uh, to actually be here and listen to to the talks. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll probably pass back now to Joe. Great, thanks Reiner and yeah, thanks again to both our speakers and uh, Reiner for yeah, really chairing a very interesting discussion um, there and for everyone else who came along and to all those committee members that we have working away in the background uh, that make this webinar possible. Uh, hopefully Jack is about to put up a, a, a certificate of attendance slide for those who need it and that'll be 
uh, available for about a minute after we wrap up. And just to announce that our next meeting is going to be an in-person meeting in London. Uh, the venue exactly to be decided, um, but keep an eye on our social media so that we can uh, update you with the speakers and the, um, the details, but that's going to be the 13th of October. Um, so that's it from us. Yeah, and um, we wish everyone a nice weekend and thanks everybody for joining.